So as Chrissy said, I'm Tony Kaiser. I'm the Assistant Director for Collections Management at the National World War II Museum. My main function at the museum is really kind of simple, but kind of complicated. I oversee all of the artifacts in our collection. I make sure that they're well taken care of, that they're stored properly, that they get any kind of conservation treatments that they might need. And with a team of people, we catalog them and house them and put them out on an exhibition and travel them in shows. Um, and that's probably a lot more complicated than what a lot of other people are going to be doing with their collections. But um, I want to sort of show you some basic things that you can do at home and some steps that we do here at the museum to take care of our artifacts. So let's see, here we go. One of the things that we talk about with all historic artifacts, no matter what era they are from, are what we call the um, seven hazards to historic artifacts or factors of artifact deterioration. So I'm gonna walk you through these seven steps, seven items, and then I'll go and talk about each of them individually and how you can uh, store and handle your items to prevent them. So light is one of the most detrimental um, factors in artifact deterioration. It will certainly speed up, those UV rays will speed up fading. Um, fluorescent lights will also fade textiles and paper items are also very susceptible to light. So we'll talk about some ways that you can mitigate light at home and like we do in the museum, often our galleries are very dim to avoid light. Temperature and humidity are also two factors that really have to be taken into account when you are dealing with items of a historic nature. So temperatures that are too high or too low or sudden changes in temperature can be really stressful on artifacts. So we recommend that you not store your historic items in sheds, attics, basements, um, crawl spaces, other places where the HVAC or the air conditioning in your home or the heat in your home doesn't necessarily reach. Um, you also want to avoid storing them really close to the vents where they get a lot of air and often dust blown directly onto them. Humidity um, is another factor. Um, it'll uh, lead to mold growth. It will swell wood and paper items and for metal it will promote rust. So we want to also try to avoid humidity. Also you have to balance that because low humidity will cause artifacts to shrink, um, make them brittle and much more susceptible to breaking. So we'll talk about some uh, sweet spots uh, for these factors as well. And of course, pests. We all hate bugs in our house. I certainly do too. Um, and different pests are attracted to different types of materials. So depending on what you're working with or what you're trying to preserve, you'll need to keep these kind of factors in mind. Um, roaches and silverfish, um, like paper and books and some textiles. Uh, moths also, of course, I think we're all very familiar with moth holes in our uh, historic, especially wool, often clothing. And then for wood items, you have to be careful about termites. Um, so here's a couple of pictures of some of the pests that you might encounter um, and need to take care of. And of course, us, human beings. Um, we touch stuff all the time with our bare hands. Uh, we continue to use it, which causes wear and tear and then we drop things and often we forget things. We forget where we put something, we forget uh, that we left it in the barn or in the garage and they deteriorate that way too. So chemical reaction and air pollution, we often think of this as being stuff that is outside, but it can also be things that are inside. Um, so certain materials are more susceptible to other than others like iron, marble, uh, rubber and wood. Um, outdoor items like vehicles, if they're not stored or covered properly, chemical reactions and air pollution can be a big factor um, that can cause rust, uh, rust um, rotting, and then something that we call off-gassing, which often happens as wood or other artifacts or other materials age, they emit compounds that can be detrimental to the other things in your collection. So we factor those into air pollution as well. And so having good filtration systems inside um, will help to make sure that those chemical reactions and those air uh, pollutants get pulled out of the air. And then Inherent vice is the most difficult and ultimately kind of impossible factor to mitigate. Um, this has to do when the composition or the chemical makeup of an artifact causes its own deterioration. 
So rubber um, is chemically unstable. So you'll see often with World War II items that it either becomes very brittle and flakes or it does the opposite and it gets very oozy and gooey and kind of just begins to drip. Um, I have opened a box with um, a gas mask in it once and it scared the crap out of me because it had begun to ooze and it kind of looked like the gas mask was crying. I, it was, I was scared myself. I was like, oh, what is that? So rubber. Um, leather um, can also be one. It's often treated or tanned with chemicals that can eat away at the leather over time. If you're familiar with this and you can see it on leather jackets where it just starts to flake away. Um, it'll also have over time have something that might be called bloom where the fats and the salts from your own skin that have been absorbed into it will start to come out. Um, and so depending on what they, it's been treated with or tanned with or even the conditioners that are used in it, um, those can affect it over time. Uh, heavily beaded gowns or weighted silks or other fabrics where there's a lot of stress on the seams or the maybe the thread uh, wasn't quite right. You can see what's often called um, the, like the shredding of the, of the silk in that bottom picture. And then film is another one that's also often inherently unstable and because it's acetate based um, you often get what's called vinegar syndrome. So if you have historic film and you open it and you get that big whiff of vinegar, that's the acetate of the film kind of deteriorating. So that's a very clear sign that you need to sort of do some steps to mitigate that um, deterioration of the film. So ways that you can combat these factors of deterioration. The main thing is to think before you act because what you wanna do is make sure that anything that you're gonna to do to the items isn't something that will later cause more harm to it. So for light, some of the best things that you can do are use boxes, sleeves, covers um, to keep items out of ambient light and from sunlight. So store items away from windows. Um, if you wanna have something framed or on display in some way, try to keep it in a place where you can regulate the amount of light that it gets. So uh, don't keep it in a sunny room. Hallways are great and also a place that when you're not there, you can turn off the light in the room itself to sort of keep it um, away from the light. There are also ways that you can frame them that are more archivally sound so that you can use UV glass or other methods to sort of also help the paper or poster or whatever it is, sometimes flags or maps even that people like to frame as well. Um, I do recommend um, archival boxes and sleeves and covers, slip covers, that kind of thing, but they aren't necessary. There are lots of common products that you can get at your local Home Depot or Walmart or Target that you can use to store your items and you don't necessarily have to um, have the kind of archival acid-free, lignin-free boxes that, that we use. For um, temperature and humidity, I always tell people that if they are comfortable, then their items are comfortable. So typically we like to keep most artifacts around 70 degrees, a range of anywhere from 68 to 73 is, is acceptable. Um, and some items like metals like lower temperatures, but often then you're not comfortable. Um, the most important thing though, is that it's a pretty consistent temperature. So one of the things that we factor in is if we were to have a power loss and our air conditioning goes out, we have a generator, but let's just say it goes out. One of the things that we would do is actually slowly bring the temperature back into a line so that you don't end up going from say like 90, 89 degrees, all the way back down to 68 or 70 really rapidly. We would use, we would do that over a series of days in order to give things time to acclimate within the storage area. Uh, temperature and humidity are related. We always talk about them together. And so you wanna make sure that your relative humidity is at about 50%. Um, 48 to 52 is sort of acceptable, but some of the things will also depend on where you live. Where we live here in uh, South Louisiana, 50% isn't always something that we can really achieve without a huge expenditure or just because of the nature of how humid it is here in the summer. So we will often let that range go up to 55 or 56% and just make sure that we're monitoring for any mold or mildew or any kind of humidity issues like curling of paper or um, 
if things look like they're starting to sag. Um, but if you were in, say, someplace like the Rocky Mountains where it's very dry, 30% or 40% uh, might be a more reasonable range. So one of the things that you'll have to figure out sort of based on where you are is uh, what those kind of acceptable ranges are. Now, most people aren't controlling for humidity specifically in their homes like we are at the museum and our storage areas. So that the degree range, that 68 to 73, is still really ideal. You're relatively your relative humidity will probably stay pretty well in line. Um, you can also use things like desiccants, um, you know, those little silica packets that you get when you buy a pair of shoes or a purse or something like that. You can sometimes use those if you're living in a hum humid environment, if you wanna try to pull out some more moisture in the area. Pests. So another reason not to do attics, basements, sheds, barns, et cetera, is that it's the place where pests live. Again, I, this is where if you're comfortable your artifacts are comfortable and so you want to make sure that you um, have an area that's free of things like roaches, spiders, termites, and things like that. Part of that is that you have to regularly inspect your items. I, I find silverfish and things like that all the time even though I you know am regularly looking for them. Um, they just make their way in and so one of the things that you'll want to do is have a sort of annual or biannual time when you take them out, look at them, make sure nothing's getting in those boxes or in those containers. And I can't stress, stress this enough, do not use mothballs. I know that they are this uh, old-fashioned way to keep things out of your clothes, but they unfortunately, those chemicals will actually penetrate your historic textiles or linens and actually create a worse issue later. Um, they are actually very carcinogenic, so they are not healthy for you or your family members, and I would just avoid them under all circumstances. If you have things that have been stored with mothballs, um, there are ways that you can mitigate that by using um, air filters and some charcoal filters to try and get some of those chemicals out. And I can give some more specific instructions on that if, if people have questions. So us human beings, we are often the worst factor in taking care of our own things. Um, one of the things that I like to emphasize is to use proper handling techniques. Um, so we always recommend that you don't pick something up by its handle. So don't pick a teacup up by its handle or a trunk by its leather strap or a suitcase by its top handle. Instead, you want to use methods where you're supporting the item all the way through, support them from the bottom. This will also help you if you're trying to carry them or move them from one place to another. Um, you'll be less likely to drop them or to bump into them, that kind of thing. Um, I also, you know, I know that some things is that people still have things that they want to use. Um, you have a tablecloth from your grandmother. You have um, a dress that somebody's going to wear again. And you can absolutely still use them. Um, but I recommend that you do so with care and only when it's really necessary. Same for moving them, um, especially if you're dealing with more fragile things like glass, china, or things that are easily breakable. Try to move them as little as possible. Um, Remember where you put it. This is one of the things that I think, you know, everybody's probably got that grandmother or that aunt who was like, oh, I had that around here somewhere 10 years ago. I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, so keep records of the items that you have and where you've put them and record as much information as you can about them. I think one of the things is that often these items get passed down from one generation to another and the stories with them sometimes do and sometimes don't and sometimes the details maybe start to get less and less. So I would recommend, especially if you're a World War II veteran or someone who you can still talk to, to ask them and to record uh, what they say about their items and how they got it and what they did with it. Um, similarly, if uh, you're not able to talk to them, who would know the most about it to be able to tell you what they might remember or where they've seen it used in the past or as part of the household as you were growing up and keep backup records. So if you keep in these things electronically, um, make sure you're saving those files or documents in another place. Um, if you're keeping them manually, maybe make a photocopy or um, think about scanning them so that way you have a digital record of, of your items. This is also really good for insurance purposes too. If you were to have an accident or something in your home where you were to lose your items, this would be a really good record to be able to reconstruct what you had as well. 
And I see a lot of questions coming in. So um, I hope I'm not going too fast because I'm definitely going to try and get to as many of those as I can. They're hard to read as I'm doing the same as the presentation at the same time. So, but I will get to them. So um, keep them coming and I'll uh, make sure to give plenty of time at the end. Um, so for chemical reactions and air pollutions, this is also often very much related to the environment in your home or wherever the items are being stored. So having good air filters in place. Um, and if you can avoid leaving your items outside, if possible, um, that's also really good. I realize if you're somebody who's collecting um, tanks, Jeeps, um, other large equipment pieces that might not be possible, but having a nice clean garage or storage space where you're able to control a little bit of the temperature and the airflow around the items can be uh, really key. And you want to avoid storing them with things that off gas. So this, this sort of chemical reaction that happens, for instance, oak is one of those woods that off gases for a very long time. And there are, um, pictures I saw when I was in museum study school where some seashells had been laid out on a new oak cabinet and they just disintegrated into nothing. The off-gassing of the oak was so acidic that it literally sort of created dust from the seashells. So um, you'll have to do a little bit of research in some ways to think about what some of those materials are, but I'll also give you a list of materials that are safe to use um, that you can, again, easily find uh, to be able to store your materials with. And the other thing that you have to keep in mind is like I mentioned with some of the textiles and the pests, different materials have different needs when it comes to selecting um, a storage material and even a storage place. So some things that are much hardier, like if you are collecting Jeeps or uh, pieces of equipment, storing them in a garage is probably fine, but I wouldn't recommend it for um, a uniform or your photo albums or things like that. And again, inherent vice, yes, because by definition, there's only so much that you can do, it's not possible to combat it entirely. Rather, you can use all of these other methods that I've talked about that will often slow that process of deterioration as much as possible. And that's really in some cases the best that you can, that you can hope to do with some of these things. So here are some basic preservation techniques. And I wanna emphasize that really the motto, much like doctors is do no harm. We wanna make sure that anything that we do to preserve our items is things that can either be undone or that we know won't cause further deterioration. So we always keep this in mind when how we proceed with how we store an artifact, um, what we do as far as conservation treatments, how we exhibit it, how we care for it overall. Um, we don't do things like laminating or varnishing because those are things that can't be undone. And I know that there were a lot of people in the 70s and 80s laminating all kinds of historic documents and we now deeply regret that. Um, try not to use chemicals like glues and tapes unless they're of an archival quality on items. So, you know, your standard pressure tape, scotch tape, duct tape, masking tape, no go. Uh, don't use it. Um, and you also, for when it comes time to clean your items, want to avoid detergents and bleaches and other things like that where the dyes or the chemicals of the soap can actually cause an adverse chemical reaction. So here are some basics. Um, store your items in climate controlled spaces. If you can, use acid free materials like boxes, tissue paper, photograph sleeves, uh, things like that. And wear gloves, we wear gloves. This guy's an older picture, he's wearing cotton gloves. We often wear the purple nitrile gloves now. Um, or just make sure your hands are clean and wash your hands really often as you're working with your materials. So here's some basics for textiles. And this might be answering some of the questions that are coming in, but I'll make sure to uh, get into really specific ones as they're asked as well. If you can, store your textiles in a flat position. So um, although some garments, like say real heavy wool overcoats, would be fine to hang in a closet, other more delicate things, like if you have dresses, wedding dresses, or even just some of the more common wool uniforms, um, if you could lay them flat in a box without any folds, that would really be ideal. The gravity um, will often weigh down those garments and you can find a lot of stretching in the shoulders or a lot of places where the sleeves come apart. Um, so you wanna try and maintain that original shape as much as possible. 
Um, if you can, remove any staples or pins. You know, often when people would take things to the dry cleaner, they would staple a ticket or pin the number onto it. And you wanna make sure that you take out any of those pins or staples because that metal is often not of a high enough quality because it was meant to be kind of ephemeral. So it'll often rust and create stains or issues with on your garment. But I get a lot of questions about insignia. And for me and for us at the museum, I would recommend leaving the insignia intact on a uniform if you have it. Two reasons. One, it's really easy to lose if they're separated. Much more likely that you it will stay in place if it's left on the jacket itself. But also too, taking it on and off can create more wear and tear with on, within the jacket. So if you're missing that pinhole each time that you're taking it on and off, um, then you're just gonna create a bigger hole and a bigger, uh, area where you can have tearing or loss. So I do recommend that people leave um, the insignia on the uniforms if they have it. Um, if you're not able to store a textile perfectly flat, for instance, let's say you do have a wedding dress or a longer uh, piece of a garment or flag, um, make certain that there are no hard creases or folds. And so what we will often do is create tissue paper logs. Um, so just crumble up some tissue paper, make a log and lay that into the fold and then drape your flag, your dress uh, over it and do that all the way through as you, as you store them in bins or boxes. Um, I would recommend using acid-free tissue. Acid-free tissue relative to a lot of the other materials that I talk about is not prohibitively expensive. I would not recommend using the sort of um, gift wrap tissue that you would be able to find readily at your at you know CVS or Target or your party supply store or whatever. Um, I definitely would recommend um, getting some acid-free tissue. And for um, garments that have a lot of structure to them, uh, a jacket, the body of a jacket, uh, dresses, you also can make sort of um, supports, inner supports with tissue paper to help keep that shape so that you're, you don't get creases in your sleeves um, or um, lose, you know, a lot of caving within the jacket and things like that too. Um, for some garments, storing them on a hanger um, is, if that's your option, that's fine. Um, or for some items, like I mentioned, the big heavy overcoats that are pretty structurally sound, um, they are very good to put on a padded hanger. So you can buy a regular hanger and pad it yourself with a cotton or polyester batting and then a cotton overlay. You can also buy padded hangers from some of the archival suppliers that I'll, um, I'll show you at the end. Um, the main thing is just to make sure that it's following the natural shape of the shoulder. So you don't want something that's too big um, or too small. And this is where using um, like polyester batting and kind of doing it yourself really works to help make a custom kind of hanger. Um, I have the luxury of a couple of volunteers who regularly come to, before COVID, regularly come to the museum and make custom hangers for me. They are wonderful. Um, so shout out to Marie and Annette <laughs> if they're listening, because um, they they do wonderful things like that for me to be able to make sure that a lot of our jackets and heavier garments have that inner support. So large flat textiles like quilts or flags, they can also be rolled. So if you have the storage capacity to be able to roll something, um, you can get an acid-free or a cardboard tube and cover it with acid-free tissue and then leave that inner, leave an inner layer of tissue um, and roll it up. And that's actually a really great way to store a quilt, tablecloth, flag, that kind of thing where creases uh, really can form over time. And if you can, it's great to store them horizontally and off the floor. So if you're going to roll it, don't stand it on end and leave it in a closet because it's just going to eventually slump down and create a lot of stress. So it does need to be something that you can store um, horizontally in the top of a closet or under a bed, inside a container, that kind of thing. Um, so a couple of things. Don't store your heirloom textiles in sealed plastic bags. I know that this is one of the things that people often think that they want to do to be able to protect them from bugs or dust or other things like that. But the plastic itself and the creating that um, inner environment, you can actually create what we call a micro environment. And if you do get a fluctuation in temperature and humidity, it can condense on the inside and get your garment wet. Um, but um, 
also just creating that tight of a seal makes it really hard to see what's happening inside and you're going to create a lot of wrinkles and creases in your garment as well. Um, dry cleaning bags are actually okay. Um, just don't tie the bottom closed. So if you don't, if you do go get that dress or that jacket cleaned uh, by a professional, um, not a regular commercial dry cleaner, I'll get to that in a second, but a professional historic cleaner, um, and you have those bags, putting it over it is great. I would actually recommend that you use um, a cotton muslin dust cover um, of an unbleached nature rather than the plastic, but if what you have is the plastic, then that will work. Um, so you can make these dust covers pretty easily um, with just, you know, it's just a, if you're at all inclined to sew just a couple of seams and a hole at the top for your hanger to come through. Um, and we use these quite a lot too at the museum um, to create dust covers for our storage shelves and for different um, larger pieces is, um, of furniture and things like that too. So um, if you best would be if you could store it in an acid free box with a lid, not always possible though. Um, you can also use the unbleached muslin that you've washed um, instead of tissue paper. If that's something that you have on hand, you can do that as well. Um, don't wash your historic textiles in a washing machine, especially if we're talking about uniforms, um, wool uniforms, you definitely don't want to do that. And um, try not to take them to a commercial dry cleaner to get clean by tumbling. Um, that is also very hard and those chemicals are very hard on uh, historic textiles. They might not survive it um, overall. So there is one safe detergent that we often use for cleaning things. It's called Orvis Paste. Um, that's sort of a brand name. Um, it's often called quilt wash or quilt soap. So if you have a local fabric store, um, you can often get what's called quilt wash or quilt soap. And that is sort of the very like no dyes, no harsh chemicals and is safe for your historic textiles. I would recommend that you hand wash items that you feel like need to be washed. And I can give you some video tutorials at the end that uh, can help you sort of get you an idea of, of how best to do that. And again, don't use a commercial dry cleaning company. There are companies out there that are um, uh, used to working with historic items that are commercial companies, but they're not a, your standard uh, down the street dry cleaner. I will say um, one thing I didn't mention for textiles um, that I wanted to mention is that for storing textiles, if you're not going to do archival boxes um, or the padded hangers or that, and you want to use like a plastic bin, like you think of like the Rubbermaid tubs or the Sterilite bins that you can get at, you know, your big box store, those are fine to use. They aren't necessarily what we use, but they are great still at protecting your stuff. And they don't create that micro environment like you would that you would get in sealed plastic bags. So you could use those just like you would an archival box um, with the padded tissue or the muslin and the wrapping of the materials um, to be able to store your items. Um, I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be asking me questions about paper and photographs, lots of letters, lots of diaries, photographs. Um, the thing to remember is that most paper that's been made in the last 300 years, which is pretty much the stuff that we're talking about for World War II, um, was made um, from cotton or linen, wood pulp. So rag paper has a low acid content um, and is more stable than pulp paper, whereas wood pulp paper, which is what we're using a lot of now, is the kind used for newspapers. It's really acidic and it deteriorates really rapidly. So if you get a newspaper regularly and you, you leave the Sunday Times out for a few days on your kitchen table, you'll notice that it's already yellow. Um, very typical of this, of paper of this time as well. So the best thing for documents is if you can store them flat without any folds or creases. So if you do have that newspaper that you want to save um, and you can still get it flat, that would be great. If it already has that really hard fold in it and opening it would create breakage, then leave it folded. So because the folding weakens the fiber at that point, and that's why you get that that breaking when you try to when you try to open it up. So if you have rag paper versus pulp paper, um, would recommend storing them separately. So for instance, if you have somebody who wrote letters on a nice um, stationery or letterhead versus those newspaper clippings, I would recommend keeping them in separate boxes. Or again, you could also use uh, some of these plastic commercially available um, storage bins that would also work well. Um, 
and display any documents or postcards um, or currency. A lot of people like to frame, you know, money from different places um, with quality mats and backing boards. And be sure to specify to your frame shop that you want archival quality materials, acid free and UV glass if it's within your budget. I would think that the other thing that you want to ask them to do is you want to make sure just like you don't want to do any harm or do anything that can't be undone to your items. Make sure that they're getting framed in a way that they could be easily taken apart without any kind of tapes or binders to the pieces um, to get them to stick to the mats because that's something that you that can't be undone. So, um, so for photographs and for sometimes for documents, if you want to um, use chemically inert plastic sleeves. I'll have a link to that at the end. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And this is different than the plastic sleeves that you're going to get at like say Office Depot or something like that where um, You know the protector sheets. They're a little bit different quality. Do not use rubber bands um, staples straight pins um, or paper clips when storing your historic documents. Um, that is where the sleeves or using um, a series of folders um, would actually be much more helpful than the paper clips. They will dent the paper over time. You always run the risk of it um, puncturing and ripping if you're trying to take it off also. We also recommend that you do not use ballpoint or felt tip markers to write on the paper. Um, if you feel like you want to label photographs, do so on the back with a soft pencil. Um, you may also want to create your own numbering system where you then uh, record all the information about the photograph on a separate piece of paper where you can write out a much longer description. Um, another alternative I've seen that I think works really well is if you're able to photocopy or scan your photograph, you can then write the information on the photocopy or record it on the scan. Um, and we recommend that you never write on the front of your photographs. Um, I know that this was, a lot of people would do that, they would circle dad in a, in a big picture of a group. Um, if it's already done, it's done, but it's not something that we would recommend that people do um, further to it. Um, also too, one of the things that happens is if, if you're writing in some of those inks and you put the photographs down on each other, it won't quite dry and it will transfer to the image that you lay on top of it. So um, we always recommend pencils for anything related to book and paper and photograph material altogether. Just don't even have them open on your desk or on your table. Take them all away. So that way you don't even get the stray smudge um, on your material. You also want to do your best to minimize the risk of water damage. So, you know, if you get um, a wool coat wet, it's fixable. Um, if you get a letter wet, it probably won't be fixable. That ink will most likely run and you might not ever be able to get that information back. So you want to definitely make sure that you're storing items or um, handling them away where there's no risk of water damage. I would also include, let's say you have them out on the dining room table, um, no coffee, no water, clear the table and just work with your artifacts right there. Um, and just keep as much um, in mind of your surroundings as you can. And in some cases, I did recommend gloves for some things. Um, clean hands are good. Uh, also, but actually often when it comes to paper items, we recommend clean hands um, because often the gloves will actually make you clumsier and you could run the risk of breaking the edges of the pages as well. Um, but for photographs, you definitely want to make sure you're not getting your fingerprints on those. So we do recommend the nitrile gloves, especially if you're going to be working to try to get them into sleeves, you want to wear gloves. Um, the other thing that you want to be careful of is that some wood bookcases um, can off gas and have reactions with paper items. So if you have older bookcases in your home that are 10, 20, 30 years old, you're probably fine. But if you're buying something new or you're buying um, something that's made out of a composite or a plywood uh, and that will often off gas for a while. So you would want to make sure that you do put your historic artifacts there, especially paper. Books and scrapbooks. Um, this is often the same techniques that you're going to see for um, the paper and photograph material. Books should be stored on end and um, you want to avoid when they're on a shelf pulling them by the tab off the shelf. Instead, you'll want to kind of grab them from the middle. Um, you'll see a lot of older books that have that that ripped upper edge. So that's one of the things that you'll want to um, try to avoid. For scrapbooks, we'd recommend that they're stored flat and in an acid-free box if possible. Again, also if you have a properly sized plastic container, um, maybe with tissue around the edges, that's possible too. 
Um, you can interleave with acid-free paper if you need to. And one of the things to think about with scrapbooks is that they often do have an inherent vice and in that the acidic nature of the pages of the book can often cause some deterioration within itself. So depending on what is in the scrapbook, you might find that you want to take some things out or leave things in. We try to leave our scrapbooks as intact as possible because the way that people put them together and where and how and why they decided to create it the way that they did is part of what we want to preserve. So I would recommend doing that, but if you have something in particular that's creating an issue with the things around it, you could, you could remove it. Um, for instance, uh, one of the things that I've seen is sometimes people will take like a metal pin or a button and stick it into the paper, but then it starts to rust, which could spread to the other things. And that's something that you might want to take out, but just note where it goes and leave it with the scrapbook itself. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about conservators and professional conservators. And I would say that with all of these items, before you do anything um, to try to clean or, or uh, deacidify in this case, uh, which is something that you'll see a lot on different sites, um, that you should consult a professional conservator. And I'll have a resource for that at the end as well. So film and negatives. And so separate from photographs, you might still have the negatives from uh, the photo, from the printing. Um, and the film itself, maybe eight millimeter, 16 millimeter taken on a movie camera. I'm surprised at how many people managed to have film uh, while they were in the middle of the Pacific, even <laughs> taking, taking movie footage. It's pretty great. So 1940s film has an acetate base. And like I said before, um, as it deteriorates and it has that chemical reaction, it releases acetic acid. So it's again, it's why we call it vinegar syndrome. And you want to store um, film away from other materials because of that uh, vinegar syndrome. That acetic acid will actually migrate into your other items. So if it's in a box with a scrapbook, if it's in a box with a jacket, that acid is going to create issues within that box. And believe it or not, film likes the freezer. Uh, this is probably the one exception to the 78 or 70 degree, 68 thing, and uh, 50% humidity. Um, this is the way to stop any deterioration within your film if, if it's started. So what we recommend is to double bag it in um, plastic zip top bags. So again, the thing that I said not to do before is the thing that I'm telling you to do here. Um, label it, that is really a key thing, label it, and then store it in just your regular household freezer. If you have a chest freezer that you access less often, that kind of thing. Um, but just make sure that you remember where it is. And if you are ever to have some kind of an event where your freezer goes out, um, make sure that you take care that uh, it doesn't condense on the inside and so you take it out of all those bags as well. Um, and I have a typo in my PowerPoint presentation, which I just realized so that you don't want to use intern sleeves. You want to use inert sleeves. Fix that for next time, sorry. Um, and these are the same kind of sleeves that you would use for your photographs. Um, they're just of a smaller size and often in that strip shape that you see that negatives come in. So for metal artifacts uh, like firearms, edged weapons, swords, knives, daggers, any of that kind of thing, the main goal is to prevent any corrosion or oxidation uh, of the metal. Um, you want to be careful about polishes because not all of them are of a grade that is actually good for your metals, your historic metals. What you do with your silver and your things that you're using every day versus what you do often with your historic things are different. Um, you also want to for firearms, um, avoid the excess, uh, excessive use of lubricants. Um, waxes are better. And safety first, always keep in mind um, that you are dealing with a weapon. Uh, make sure that they are also stored um, safely as a weapon first, and then make sure that you're trying to do your best to take care of them from an artifact, artifact point of view as well. And one of the things about firearms that you'll have to decide is if you want to maintain the firearm as a functioning weapon or as a non-firing weapon. So we at the museum, we maintain ours as non-firing weapons. So we do not treat them as you would a weapon that you want to continue to take out and shoot um, on the range or hunt with or anything like that. And if you are deciding to maintain it as a firing weapon, often the things that you're doing, regular cleaning, 
oiling, um, all of that is, is sufficient. Um, you might just want to be careful about the oils and the lubricants that you're using um, versus a non-firing collection where rather than use an oil or a lubricant that you would have to have to be able to fire, we will instead clean off as much of that as possible and use a kind of paste wax um, instead. Um, for edged weapons, we do recommend that you keep them stored in a scabbard or sheath if you have it. This is a safety thing, um, but it also is less likely to get lost or separated if the two of them are in there. And then the blade itself will be better protected, which actually is kind of the most sensitive part often of the edged weapon. Wood. Um, so wood is relatively stable material to preserve. Um, the thing that you have to worry about is large fluctuations in temperature are humi and humidity are very hard on wood. And so if you're somebody like me who lives in South Louisiana, you know that first day that the humidity really hit because that door is just so much harder to open. It just sticks so much more. So um, you wanna, again, just keep wood as much as you can in a really stable environment. Um, try not to over clean or over polish your wood items. Um, use linseed oil or other, or, um, other, I'm sorry, don't use linseed oil or other oil-based products on your wood. Instead, what you would want to use is something called Renaissance or a paste wax, and that will help to protect and polish your wood items. You're not going to get quite that sheen that most people are used to with, a, with an oil-based product, but that oil will leak leach into the wood itself and create issues over time. So we recommend that people just use a, a sort of top polish wax instead. So if you have leather items, um, flight jackets, boots, tack, holsters, even belts, things like that, um, the storage methods are actually really similar to textiles. Um, if the leather is dirty or moldy, you can wipe it with a soft lint-free cloth, like just those microfiber towels that you can get at um, like an auto store or whatever. We don't recommend using saddle soap. Again, just like the other uh, issues with detergents, it can create more issues. If you do feel like you need a really um, gentle soap, you could use the Orvis paste diluted in a lot of water to sort of wash the leather. Um, and believe it or not, magic erasers uh, work really great on leather um, and just use a very light pressure. We've done this with some of our tack to sort of help clean it and shine it up and it actually works pretty well. Um, if you feel that the leather is overly dry or stiff, do not oil it. I know that that's one of the things that people want to try to do. And this again might be a question of uh, for tack, probably less so than boots and flight jackets. If it's something that you want to use, how you maintain it um, for use versus how you maintain it to preserve it are very different. And that's, those are the things you'll have to ask yourself about some of your items. Um, so for leather objects in the museum, we do not necessarily need them to be rendered flexible again, like with tack or even a flight jacket, because their function is no longer the same. Um, instead, what we want to do is support any stiffened leather and then use proper storage methods to make sure that it doesn't uh, break or crack further or become completely broken apart. You'll see that a lot with um, the straps and various things for tack where it's just where that buckle hit it time and time again, it starts to just break into two pieces. Um, for boots, you can lightly stuff the toes or the shoes to help them maintain the shape. Um, you can use um, acid-free cardboard or acid-free folders to sort of create um, a support overall. Um, if you want, you can get like good quality boot stretchers that are sized properly that will also help to maintain any kind of boots or shoes. Um, and I also recommend that you go ahead and do up the laces and the buckles because that's help what, what helps to create the support within the shoe itself. And for those of you out there collecting vehicles and other larger pieces of equipment, um, do recommend that you store them in garages or other enclosed and covered spaces. Those, that exposure to rain and elements, tree sap, pollen, bird poop, all of that will really deteriorate your vehicles over time. So as much as possible, cover them, keep them covered in, in like a carport even, or a garage is really best. Um, and then we like to talk a little bit about conservation versus restoration. So in some ways, conservation for us is keeping what you have in the best condition that you can. And so if you have, say, a Jeep and you, it, you just got it and it is what it is and you just want to make sure it's not, you know, it's not running, you don't want it to run, you just want it for a static piece, 
that's really more about conservation or preventative conservation, preventing any further deterioration versus restoration, which is when you're rebuilding that engine, uh, getting new old stock tires, uh, making it run again, new canvas covers, any of that kind of stuff. So conservation versus restoration is one of the things that we talk about a lot, mainly in for us uh, when it comes to vehicles. And interestingly enough, we like to restore our vehicles. So almost all of the vehicles at the museum from tanks um, to Jeeps run. And one of the ways that we do that is to constantly maintain them. So we have a staff that just helps us with, uh, with a team really that does all vehicles. The exception is our planes, um, not flying our planes anytime soon. All right, um, so I have a couple links for resources and supplies and we'll make sure that this information gets out there on the Facebook page and stuff too. So that way for those of you who are interested, you can uh, access these websites. These are websites that I use really often um, as well. So um, one of the ones that I like a lot is actually from the National Park Service and it's called Conservograms. And they basically have a conservogram for any of the major types of materials that you're gonna be encountering. And so you can just search National Park Service conservagram wood, conservagram knife, and they and it will come up with uh, something for you. But there's a link to that as well. Uh, similarly, for uh, book, paper, scrapbook, letters, diaries, that kind of things, the National Archives, um, they have a holdings maintenance website that they update really regularly with their standards and protocols for how they care for their paper collection. Um, if you have film, I would recommend the home film preservation guide. And this is geared specifically towards those of you doing these kinds of things at home with the kind of resources that you would have. Um, and then maybe not anytime soon, but if you have the ability, I would highly recommend taking a class at the International Preservation Studies Center. They are geared towards museum professionals, but they also offer classes on a range of topics that have to do with historic preservation. Um, so you might find something there that interests you as well. So these are some of the suppliers that I use most often. Um, Gaylord Archival is a great company and they are they supply almost anything that you could need to help take care of your collection. Um, pretty reasonable prices and often their unique thing is that you can just buy one of something versus sometimes when we buy, we buy 10, 50, 100 things and we get a discount, but you can just buy like one box. Uh, from them. Um, and then print file archival storage is where you're going to want to go to get all of those photo sleeves and inner negative sleeves that I mentioned um, so that you can uh, get all your, your photographs and everything in good shape. Then um, the American Institute for Conservation, AIC. Um, if you want to find a conservator in your area and with the specialty of what you have, uh, that's their website there, culturalheritage.org. They'll help you find somebody in your area. You can say, I have textiles, I have film, and they'll lead you to um, a certified co uh, conservator um, there. Okay, I think then we are ready for some questions. So, all right, I'm going to start at the top. Um, so Yvonne asks, what is the best way to make copies of photograph albums and letters from a World War I to veteran? Um, so it might depend on the tools that you have available, um, but one of the great things about cell phones is that they actually take really good pictures. So if you just want them for reference, you could lay them out and just take pictures with them, take pictures of them either with your phone camera or um, a higher quality digital SLR. Um, otherwise, if it's safe to do so, I would recommend that you scan them. Uh, some of the resources that I can point you to will give you some standards for uh, scanning. The main thing about a photograph album that you would want to be careful about is the binding. So you wouldn't want to open it or scan it or put it flat on anything where the binding might end up breaking um, or coming apart in some way. Um, Paul asks, do you have World War II era comics? And if so, um, how do you handle them? Yeah, we do. We have some comics. Um, we treat them like other sort of acidic paper. They were often printed on that type of sort of newspaper -y type stuff. So if they're particularly fragile, we will put them in a sleeve. Um, otherwise, we just use acid-free folders um, and, you know, uh, a tag at the top. Uh, tag uh, like a section of a folder that we've cut that we insert and put the number on. Um, that is actually one of the things that's really key if you can use uh, acid-free materials to do so. It will help to absorb some of the acids, but 
also over time you'll have to replace them because the nature of the folders will also become acidic. Sean is asking, um, interested in the care and repair of tool steel items to remove rust and restoration, bayonets, from, okay, entrenching tool shelves. So um, the one thing about metal and metal from this era is that it's actually pretty hardy. So some of the other things that you would do to remove rust um, on other garden tools, you can do on your entrenching tools and your other firearms, you'd have to be a little bit more careful about because you don't want to lose the bluing or any of the finish in that way. Um, steel wool might be an option. And um, there's also some good YouTube channels on fixing historic metal that I could point you to as well. Um, but yeah, rust, and you want to get that rust off there and you want to make sure that it's not active and that you're storing it in a place where it won't reactivate. From Joseph, I have an original um, identified to a British major, uh, sorry, uniform um, displayed on a mannequin um, I would really like the idea of having it on display, but what is the best way to care for it while it was still, while still being able to showcase it? So this is sort of the balance between, you want to balance that exposure to light, um, the fluctuations of temperature and humidity, the dust that it would be um, around. If you do want to display it on a mannequin, I would just recommend that you make a dust cover so that when it's not on display or you're not showcasing it, you can put a dust cover over it that whatever room it's in is one that you can turn the lights off and actually can get completely dark um, so that you're putting either blackout shades on your windows to draw or something of that, something of that nature. Um, but having, I understand, yeah, the desire to have it on display. It sounds like a great piece. So those are a couple of things that I, that I would recommend. Um, Michael asks, how do I remove the mothball smell from inside of a cedar chest? Okay, this is going to be hard because the cedar itself, uh, the wood, has absorbed it. Um, and it might not ever come out entirely. But I would look for some um, charcoal, um, uh, activated charcoal. And you can create... Um, what we often do is get uh, socks, like athletic socks, and put the activated charcoal in in a couple of layers, sew it shut, and then essentially you have like a charcoal packet. And leave those in there. It's going to take a long time. Rotate them out. Once the charcoal doesn't seem like it's doing a good job anymore, toss it, get some more activated charcoal. That is the best way that we can find to get um, a lot of the mothball smell out of the things that we have. It also works pretty well for cigarette smoke. So when you have a collection or you have textiles especially that have been in a um, smoke environment, uh, wood smoke maybe from a wood stove, but also a cigarette smoke environment, that charcoal method is also very, very helpful. Um, and then someone asks if we recommend uh, cedar sachets in lieu of mothballs. You can use cedar. It's actually pretty, um, pretty decent. It's not, it's also going to have its own effects. Um, but for people doing and storing things at home, I have a cedar chest. I store my grandma's quilts in it. Um, it's, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty acceptable way to go. Um, let's see. Is it possible to uncurl old photographs? Yes, it is. But I would recommend that you get a professional to help you um, or to show you how to do it first because what you could run the risk of is breaking the photograph. Um, we often get these scrolled photos. You have like a long panoramic photo off of like the whole unit. Um, and they've been stored in a tube for 75 years since somebody got it from boot camp. It, it is possible. Um, but again, I would recommend that you work with somebody um, to do it at least one first um, because you can run the risk of breaking the photograph. Um, let's see. And so Lisa asks or says, uh, my grandfather was a saddle maker and I have some of his tools and they're getting rusty in Houston humidity. Advice for removing using or preventing it from continuing. So again, with rust, you can try steel wool um, and get some of that and try to get the rust off. Then you could use a paste wax like the Renaissance wax to protect the metal itself once you've gotten it cleaned. And then I would highly recommend that you store them inside somewhere. So not in a garage, no longer in a shed. Um, because that that humidity is really the thing that's going to bring um, that that rust back. So let's see, I have a couple other ones. Where did my chat go? Oh, there we go. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting my 
windows here. Um, so Charlie on Facebook asks if there are any tips in caring for your dad's duffel bag um, and Fujifilm wrapped in tin foil. So for the duffel bag, um, that's probably something that you're going to want to try to clean. Um, they were suitcases essentially, so they can often be pretty dirty. Um, I'll, I can drop some links on Facebook later for some ways to clean uh, the duffel bag. So Orvis paste, wash, hand wash, just to try and get some of the surface dirt off of it. You could also vacuum it. And then again, I would recommend either an acid-free box or um, a, a nice, you know, sturdy plastic bin. Um, and, and you use tissue paper to stuff it out. You don't necessarily have to stuff it out fully because that would sort of take up a lot of space, um, but you want to fold, you want to pad those creases um, and just make sure that any of the buckles or anything aren't rusting and are also clean. For the film, I would take it out of the tin foil and freeze it, like I mentioned with the two bags. Uh, save the foil, um, but the foil might create um, a bit of a micro environment at it, uh, about it. And then Patrick asks, what about cedar or lavender? Um, I think it covered cedar, but no lavender. Um, that is another thing that over time actually will, can um, cause deterioration to your items and can cause staining. That's the other thing about lavender and the oils that are in it is you don't always know what the base of the lavender or the essence is and it can create other issues. Um, and then Chris on Facebook says they have their grandfather's uniform, but it was in a basement for years and needs cleaning and we're concerned about damaging it. Um, I would recommend that you find a conservator. That is the easiest solution because they will make sure that they clean it in a way to get rid of any of the surface dirts, make any repairs that are necessary, but do it in a way that's not going to hurt the jacket itself. Um, Teresa asks, what about old photos and frames uh, where they may get stuck to the glass? If it is not already stuck to the glass, I would recommend taking it out. If it is stuck, you're gonna need um, a conservator to help you with that. Um, and save the frame. Certainly the frames are historic and they have a part of it as well. Um, but you can also just try to make sure that the photograph itself isn't touching the glass because that's often where you get the sticking. And as long as they're kind of stored in a place where the humidity is lower, um, again, that 50% or lower, it should help with the sticking. Um, let's see, Victor, how about safely storing military medals? Um, I would recommend for medals that you uh, wrap them in tissue and store them in a small box. You want to kind of avoid them clanking together or being shifted about uh, within a box itself. So there's something that actually could live in your jewelry box if you have a nice jewelry box where you can store them that way. Um, but I would wrap them in tissue. Again, I would avoid um, sealing them in a little plastic bag just because of the metal uh, of the metals itself uh, could could condense and uh, if you get a temperature flux. Um, Victor wants to know if water stains can be removed from paper. It is possible. It will depend on the exact nature of the paper. Um, we, call, we call those tide lines. Um, and sometimes it's possible to push the tide line out, um, but it will just depend. And I would recommend a, a paper conservator for that one because you could run the risk of, of ruining the rest of the document um, on the, for that. Let's see. Jim asks, um, does anyone make picture frames that are viewable from either side that will allow paper materials such as postcards to be viewed from both sides? Yeah, actually. So I think you could go to a frame shop um, and get a UV Plex, what we call a sandwich mount, which is mounted in such a way that you could see both sides. There might be some of those commercially available. I don't know if they would be UV Plex though. Um, but yes, definitely something that, that can be done. Um, and then Patrick asks if we would recommend steaming garments. Um, yes, actually, one of the things that we do to help with wrinkles and cleaning of items is to steam them. The main thing is to use distilled water. Don't just get water out of your tap or even just regular bottled water. You really want to make sure that you use distilled water in your steamer. And this is also an occasion when having a new steamer is good. That way you don't have a buildup of any of the calciums or salts or other chemicals from your water from when you've used it previously. But there are really good, um, not, not expensive sort of handheld steamers that you can use to help uh, with your garments also. Okay, that was a lot of information. It's noon, so I've talked for a full hour. I've really enjoyed all your questions. Um, I'm excited about this topic, so I'm always happy to answer more questions. You can always uh, reach out to me through the Facebook page,
and they'll forward it to my email and I'll be happy to talk to you on more topics, uh, give more guidance uh, in the chat on Facebook and drop some other links. So thank you all uh, very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next time on Zoom.